Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it looks like the sun's trying to come out today. So welcome to the virtual bookmark. We're very excited today. We have a special story time with Heidi King and her book, Saving American Beach. And we were just chatting before we started. Um, this is a beautiful book and she's going to share it with us. So that's just wonderful. And I think it's an important book because you're going to find out stuff you may not know about. And I think you'll be fascinated um, by all of that. And I, before I turn it over to Heidi, I do want to remember to tell you that she will be at the bookmark at three o'clock this afternoon. So you can come and get your book signed. So please do that and join us and get a chance to at least say hello. One more thing I want to show you is years ago when we were in our old building, there was an author, Russ Reimer, who had a book about American Beach and the Beach Lady. And I don't know if you can see this sort of glary. I have to come to the store. There she is. And there's Maveen Betch. And you can see she's holding her seven feet of hair and she has that beautiful arch at the top. And that hair is filled with political buttons. So, you know, she's a larger than life character who did amazing things and had some, you know, unanswered secrets of her own. But I think it'll be important to hear her story and hear the story of American Beach. So Heidi, I'm gonna turn it over to you because they didn't come to hear me, they came to hear you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited. <clears throat> we may have lost her. Well, it looks like we're waiting for Heidi to come back, but she's well worth the wait because she's going to share the book with you and show you the illustrations and read you the story. So it will be a special story time for you. We always have these technological glitches in this new world of crowdcast and Zoom and the insanity of uh, computers. So she will be joining us shortly and she'll be sharing the book. I can show you the book itself, Saving American Beach, and you see that beautiful picture of um, Maveen Betch. I think Heidi's gonna talk to us too, not only about the story, but about the process of writing the book and how the publisher picks the illustrator. And if you've listened to any of these other children's authors before, you know that the author does not get to choose the illustrator which seems so strange, it's their book and the pictures are so important. Um, the, but the publisher matches her up with her illustrator or the editor in this case, I think. And in this case, I think they did a perfect job. This is the perfect illustrator for this book. And I think that you will agree once you see the pictures, it just captures the spirit of American Beach and of Maveen Vetch. And I think that you will love hearing the story and reading the book and then hopefully coming by this afternoon and getting a chance to meet Heidi. Because she's sort of hiding at the moment, don't you think? I think if you all just sort of wait and sit there and have good thoughts. In the meantime, you may want to think of some questions that you have and you can type those into the part that either says say something nice or ask a question. And you can ask Heidi anything that you want or ask me anything that you want. And then we can um, answer your questions because I know that when you hear these stories and it's such a treat to meet the actual author, that there are things that you may want to know that you didn't know before. So don't miss the opportunity to come up with a good question. She says she's here. Can you see me? I can't see you, but Richard's going to try and find you. Uh oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Can you hear me, Rona? We can hear you. Yes, I okay. can hear you. So so don't say anything untoward, you know. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> think I was living for in the an alternate. Yeah, I was over on my own screen and you weren't there. So I was like, wait a minute, what happened? So Well, maybe Richard, if you get rid of me, you can get Heidi there because I'm not important to this discussion at this point. Um, see if we can find her here. Okay. She's not hiding. Well, while we're waiting to see you, I was talking about the, um, how the editor picked the illustration. Well, yes. So do you want to, you know, with that facelessly speaking, <laughs> do you want to address that question? So all our listeners will know, because I thought that was an interesting story. And in the yeah. meantime, we'll try and find your shining face. Okay. Well, it's kind of interesting because the author never gets to pick the illustrator unless you're self-publishing. And so when I submitted the manuscript, I really just had several conversations with my editor about what I 
envisioned or how I pictured the book looking. And she really took that and from there went out and really started researching artists who may be able to uh, make the book come to life. And so Equa Holmes is a very well-known um, collage artist. In fact, there's a really big exhibition right now in Boston um, of her art that um, looks amazing. I'd love to get to go and see it. But she took, um, I gave her a lot of, um, of the research that I'd done on the beach lady. And then she just took that and built her collages from there. So these are actual collages that exist um, on paper somewhere. Yes, they are. And so right now there are a few that are on display um, in, in Boston at her art exhibition. And I think the other kind of interesting thing is, you know, she really tried to put things into her collages that support the story. So you'll see p torn pieces of music or you'll see um, ticket stubs. Um, she, there's a picture of Maveen on stage as an opera singer. And if you look closely, you probably recognize the pattern, but maybe it doesn't, you know, register with you. It's actually like a little snippet of fabric that's, um, similar to Michelle Obama's dress that she wore in her portrait ah. as first lady. So little things like that, that sort of point to the history and, um, of, of the beach, but of Maveen and who she was as well. I'm going to show the picture. So yeah, you can see what you're talking about because those pictures right. are so, so incredible. Um, so, so tell us, you know, again, in your faceless voice, um, why you picked this story? Why was this story calling to you? The story of Maveen Betch um, and American Beach. The book is Saving American Beach, the biography of African-American environmentalist Maveen Betch. Um, Maveen, um, I first found out about her from my third grader who had to do a report at school on um, someone that she sort of looked up to. And as we were looking around for people, I always have tried to find the people who do something really interesting and who live outside the box. And I would say that the beach lady fits that very well. <laughs> and we, um, you know, we, we read about her and it was just such an amazing story. And I just kind of kept it in the back of my head and finally thought, you know, I really need to write this down because not only what she did in saving a beach, I mean, that seems like such a huge thing, but just the whole story of her talking about when she was a child and seeing that rope in the ocean and that would separate black people from white people swimming in the actual ocean. And I thought, could there ever have been anything more ridiculous or crazy? Did that really even happen? What, what were people thinking? Like, you know, it just, I couldn't even imagine it. And so um, I just felt like that was a really um, important thing for people to know that we'd let things get that bad. And you know, and then what came of it, how she, you know, used her experiences to really change the world. Yeah, that's so graphic. Um, mm -hmm. There's a note here that says, if you click on the help button at the top of the screen, we might be able to get your video back. Okay. I, want I think that the... I don't... Why don't I click the first link you gave me again? Just try okay. it one more time. So be ready. And I'm going to leave this page. And So assuming that Heidi comes back, she's going to read you the story. But I'm going to show you some of the pictures so you'll be ready. So it starts off with Maveen Betch as a little girl just wanting to go to the beach. We're so lucky we live at the beach and we just get to go to the beach anytime that we want. Ah, look at that. We've got Maveen Betch and Heidi. That's a good Yay. dual screen. Well, welcome back. They're tired of looking thank at you. me, so, so thank you. So why don't you um, talk about the book, read the book, and, you know, um, okay. have them look at something other than me. They see me all the time. It's not yeah. that exciting. 
How about I share my screen and then um, I'll read the book and then I can take right. questions if people want to put those in or answer your questions. So thank you and thank everybody for your patience as we battle the technology of the pandemic. Ah. <laughs> we're all we're all weary from all of this. Can you see my screen? Not yet. I see your screen trying to be a screen, but everything is more. Oh, there we go. What a beautiful screen. That's the page we were just showing. So you can see the little elements that uh, Equa put in. You can see the sheet music, you know, the real shells, the cutouts of shells. Um, so I'll just start. Um, as a girl, Maveen Betch loved the beach. She loved the whoosh of its waves, its blue sky stretching to forever, and the creature swimming in its tangy sea. But Maveen couldn't go to just any beach. Because of her skin, silken and butter brown, she couldn't eat in most restaurants or visit most bathrooms. There was even a rope in the ocean. One side said colored, the other white. Something must be done, her great-grandfather said. And so, Mr. Abraham Lincoln Lewis bought a beach. It was an ocean paradise where his family and other Black people could swim, picnic, and build sandcastles. He believed that a beach should be open to everyone. In no time, American Beach was hopping. Maveen adored her beach. At water's edge, the sandy shore became a stage. For each performance, the wind whispered an endless melody of gull cries and laughter. It made her heart sing. When she grew up, Maveen discovered the same music in the opera. She left her beloved beach to sing stories around the world. From London to Berlin, audiences sprang to their feet, demanding an encore. Bravo, they cried, beating the stage with their hands, whipping velvet curtains into rippling waves. But after the crowds went home and the stage lights dimmed, she longed for her beach. When her mother became sick, she packed her suitcase and returned home to care for her. Soon after, her mother died. Avine spent her day sitting along the shore, wrapped in a blanket of sadness. She sat and sat, so much had changed since her days on American Beach. Summer houses crumbled, bleached white as fish bones. Plastic bags littered the dunes, tangled in seagrass. The rope dividing the ocean had disappeared. There was no more need for a place like American Beach. Determined to save what remained, Maveen became the caretaker for American Beach. She picked up trash, planted trees, and remembered colorful stories about its early days when Zora Nell Hurston sunbathed on the beach and Ray Charles juked the local joints. She made American Beach her home. Each morning she bathed in the Atlantic Ocean. Each night she went to sleep on a chaise lounge to a lullaby of lapping waves. When she needed to think, she climbed atop the beach's 60 foot high sand dune, her sacred place, one of the tallest dunes on America's east coast. Strong and soft, she named it Nana, a Ghanaian word for grandmother. Before long, builders eyed American Beach as a perfect place for condos. The staccato of jackhammers replaced the whoosh of waves Trilling back hoes silenced the wind's endless melody. Avine was heartbroken. Nana cried out to her in her dreams, something must be done. She drew a line in the sand. Maveen was saving more than a beach. She pinned protest buttons to her clothes, wore seashell necklaces, and in a burst of creative protest, she grew her hair. Seven feet long and knotted together, a thick rope of silver gray. She draped it over her arm or carried it around in her suitcase. Some days, her hair reminded her of an elephant's trunk. On other days, the curve of the Niger River in Africa. 
It was hard to tell where the beach lady stopped and her beach began. The madder she grew, the braver she got. She squabbled with city commissioners, wrote letters to lawmakers, and marched to Tallahassee to fuss at the governor. Her letters went unanswered. The beach lady stood in the scorching heat alone. No one cared what the prima donna of protest had to say. More than a few people questioned the beach lady's demands. Others were past. Soon, all the little sand cocooned by palmettos, hugged by live oaks. People missed the beach. The beach lady inspired others to write their own letters and paint their own picket signs. Together, they petitioned the president, George W. Bush, to sign a law protecting American Beach forever. When the beach lady died, friends and family scattered her ashes on Nana. Her wish came true to spend forever enjoying American Beach, where a piece of paradise remains and the melody continues. Okay, we get back to. Well, one thing I guess I should have started with is this is in our own backyard. Tell us exactly where American Beach is for those of us who have been there, but not everybody knows. So it's, yes, it's right along the east coast of um, Florida, um, Jacksonville, uh, St. Augustine, if you've been to those places, you've been very close to American Beach. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my screen off here. Let's see, I think I can, there we go. It's sort of kaleidoscopic, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So very close, so easily, you know, an easy day trip from here for everybody to go and visit. So it's really a meal, part of what we would call Amelia Island. That's really the closest probably locator for us, Fernandina and Amelia Island. So if you head that way and you pass that first little gas station, that's where American Beach is. So if you've ever headed up that way, you've passed it. You just don't know that you've passed it and what that amazing um, mm -hmm. history is. So um, the story of John Lewis, he was, he was a story in himself, correct? Uh, uh, her uh, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, her great grandfather. Yes, Abraham. Oh, what a yes. what an interesting confusion I had. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, because he was the first African American millionaire in Florida, and had started a national insurance company here. And Mavine didn't. Mavine grew up very wealthy. She was. Um, you know, arrived at the beach in uh, limousines and had a chauffeur and. Her grandfather was very well respected in this neighborhood uh, or in this part of the um, state. And her, um, I think it was her grandmother, her great grandmother was part of the Kingston Plantation. Um, uh, I think the um, owner had married her grandmother or something like that, but she has ties to that as well. So she is um, a longtime Floridian with the deep roots here. And didn't he start an insurance company in Jacksonville? He did, yes. So he had a huge insurance company, a national that, that you know, was known nationally. So, and people from all over the country came to, to American Beach to hang out in its heyday. I mean, it was really a great place for African Americans to go and, and to feel like they were normal and first class citizens. You know, they could, they could do all the things that they couldn't do elsewhere um, on American Beach. Yeah, Zora Neale Hurston and Ray Charles, not for nothing. That's a pretty classy crowd. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, so Mavine Betch goes to travel the world as an opera singer and comes home because her mother is sick. But something clearly happens because, you know, she starts living on the beach and growing her hair seven feet long. She's sort of a mystery in her own right, it seems to me. We don't know really what... Um, what happened in her mind to, to set her on this path. I mean, the path is a good path, but um, she went a little off, I'd say. 
Well, I think it's, she's just like everybody else. You know, I think that we sometimes think that people who do the extraordinary things in their lives don't ever have any problems or troubles. And it's just not true. And then sometimes it's when we have trouble that makes us stronger to be able to do the things that are so amazing. And so I thought it was important to really make sure people understood that she had a time of sadness in her life, whatever that, for whatever reason. Um, like you said, you know, then that was part of it, you know, um, but, but I think having that introspection and thinking and just knowing that, um, you know, you can go through bad times in your life and still do really amazing things. And sometimes we do it because of those bad times that we, we are stronger for it. I think that's an amazing message, especially these days when everybody, I think the word I've been using is weary um, from the <laughs> pandemic and school here starts on Tuesday and um, there's always the excitement and then some trepidation. So lots going on this year and the kids who are listening have been through a hard year. You know, you're talking mm -hmm. about your children who haven't had a normal college experience. Children going to school have not had a normal uh, school year last year. We don't know what this year looks like, but maybe that this is the this will be the marker for this generation that will inspire great things. We, you know, mm -hmm. we don't give kids enough credit. They're pretty tough. You know, okay. they they might emerge from all this with just amazing surprises for us. Yeah, I tell my kids that you know their grandmother would t you know or their grandfather can talk about oh I had to walk three miles in the <laughs> snow and. I said, but your story is going to be, oh, I lived through, you know, the pandemic. So, um, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, it's not fun, but, you know, it's um, definitely going to, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it changes things and, and, and uh, inspires kids, you know, again, um, maybe we're seeing people, uh, you know, definitely we're all tired of screens, but we're still finding ways to connect that wouldn't have been possible a hundred years ago. So I think certainly it inspires storytelling and, and art. So, you know, in, in yeah. that regard, I think that's um, extremely important. You made one comment in the book about how there came a point when American Beach wasn't necessary anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. that the beaches now were no longer segregated and People of all colors could go to any beach, and there wasn't that literal line in the ocean that divided whites from colors. Um, so what about now? What is American Beach now? Well, um, American Beach now is really just more of a um, beach where people live, and a lot of people, still quite a few Amer um, African Americans have homes there. And so it's, you know, still very much a place people go for vacations and getting away. I know that Maveen's older sister is currently building a, be um, a house at American Beach. Um, I will say, you know, sometimes I think it's almost a little scarier right now. You know, back in Jim Crow days, we had that orange rope in the ocean separating people. And today that, uh, that rope is gone, but I think we have to be really careful because sometimes there are imaginary ropes that we need to be aware of and make sure that we're not, um, you know, that we acknowledge those are there and we do what we can to get rid of those. So, you know, I don't think that necessarily um, we've gotten to a place where there is no racism yet. And, you know, that's really what we're doing. I mean, this is, this is a, a story, um, this is a human story. It's not just an African American story. And I want people to, um, I want us to get to that point where it's not about, you know, we're celebrating color rather than using that to divide us or, or using anything, you know, it doesn't have to be just color. It could be, you know, even opinions right now. I mean, it's really hard sometimes when we're on different sides of thinking about things not to be more accepting of others. And um, Maveen just seemed to have this really amazing spirit that um, made people like her and be drawn to her. That's absolutely true. You know, when I 
had the honor of meeting her, I, I felt that it was a historic moment. You know, she has yeah. so many stories to tell, and I'm sorry I couldn't just spend more time with her to hear all those amazing stories. And in addition to um, fighting racism and segregation, she's also um, an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And I think she was a little bit ahead of her time. And you know, one of the really hard things about writing this book is she did so many more things. Um, you know, she has a whale named after her ah. uh, that that um, swims. And I was meaning to look it up and see if it still um, travels, if they have still been able to track it. But she she gave, you know, she was had millions of dollars. She gave to to that effort to support animals around. Mm -hmm. Butterflies were a big, big, um, very important to her, and you'll see those throughout the book. But all that research and um, different, you know, I, I just kept reading about everything she was supporting, and um, she was really, really amazing. And then just the whole idea of. You know, back in the day when, the, you know, people want to go to the beach and we need places to stay. And she kind of stood up and said, wait a minute, you know, let's save some of, let's save the sand dune. It's the largest sand dune, I believe, on the eastern seaboard um, that still remains. And so, um, you know, having to go over to Tallahassee and be that person who's always you know, pestering people, but to get them to listen to her. And, and she did it, you know. I, I could talk to you all day. I invite people to um, type in their questions so that um, we can ask Heidi. But uh, while they're thinking about those wonderful things that they have to say or ask, um, you know, people always talk about writing a children's book and, oh, you know, I put a children's book. Oh, it's just, you know, a couple of pages, usually 32 pages. And, you know, oh, <laughs> that's a lot of information to put into 32 pages. How did you find yeah. that process? Well, I've, I've always been a writer. That's what my career has been in. And um, I would say that it's much harder sometimes because it's not just a matter of, oh, I can write a paragraph about that. It's I have to find one word to say the right thing. And I think I counted up. I need to go back and look, but I think I did 54 revisions. Now, some of those could be one word. Um, some, you know, just trying to get the right word. Um, and I was trying to find to see if I had a, a good example of that. But, um, you know, so I was thinking about that. But the other thing I really thought that was important was um, I, I I think music is very important to Maveen throughout her life. And to me, I think, you know, it was just my opinion in reading about her that maybe that's what drew her to the beach is she could hear the music. You know, there's something very musical and magical about a beach. And so, you know, even after her opera career, she still was very much immersed in the music of the beach and, I thought that was really kind of something I wanted to make sure I brought out. But to do that, you can't just say it. You know, you have to find the words to kind of carry that thing through as you go. So that could be a little challenging at times. I thought it was very lyrical. It's funny because when you were reading it, one of the times that that struck me as in my adult brain, um, you said when her mother got sick, she came back. And I immediately thought you were going to say when her mother got ill. Well, that's not really... <laughs> your your word is better, <laughs> <laughs> right? And especially well, for your audience, place. and so I thought, ah, clever, yeah, yeah. And you know, there I can I can point out one place where we did like the choice of the words. Um, you know, I read a lot of news stories that actually said, you know, she's crazy, and. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, my editor and I talked about that and it's like, was she, was she really crazy? Like how do, how do kids take that? Is that what the message is? And, you know, so really what I changed here was I just said others were proud of her pluck because I think that's more, sometimes it's easy to just write people off as being crazy. They're really not. They're just doing something. They're doing something that's out of the ordinary that doesn't make it crazy. And 
um, it's easy to label people at times when we think they're, you know, got a little bit of spunk to them and they're going to stand up for what, what they believe in. So she really did have that pluck, you know. With That's a great word because we do tend to dismiss, we can dismiss people. If we, yeah. if we decide that we think that they don't comport with our way of behaving and what we think is quote normal, then we don't have to pay attention. And that's a terrible loss to us, not just right. to them to be treated that way, but to us because then we don't get their genius and their actions and, and their thoughts, which can be so important. So I think that's an important message. And we talked before you um, came on and about how a good children's book is for adults and children that because the adults are often the ones reading it so there should be something in there for them as well and i think this is a classic case of that that this is a story that adults want to share as well and leaves so much room for conversation with your children i mean i just applaud that that this just sort of checks all those boxes in such an extraordinary way i think i i don't know how many times i read this aloud just to make sure it sounded okay because Really, when I picture myself reading the children's book, it's always seeing myself at night sitting beside my daughters when they were little, reading to them. And, you know, it was important to me about how the words sound and uh, our group together and how that's going to come across to them as they're listening. So, um, yeah, I think that's a different, you know, it's important. When I'm writing a, a, a book for an adult or an article, I don't worry about the way things sound and I don't worry about the way things look on the page, the way the words are laid out on the page. But those two things are very important in children's books, I think. And, and they're also very important in poetry. I know that Robert yeah. Frost and William Carlos Williams talk about, you know, actually the way words look on a page can influence how you approach the words and their meaning and i think that's very true of children's books as well oh i think that's a great observation that's absolutely true you know i, I love that um so what are you working on next what do we have to look forward to while we're digesting and enjoying this wonderful book what comes next well i i love nonfiction because I mean, can you really make up stories that are as good as this? I mean, people can live some really amazing lives that you could not touch with fiction. So my next book um, is about John Bonner Buck, who was really sort of the father of bioluminescence. He studied all the things that glow. And so it's going to be talking about his discovery process and how he... Um, how in the continuum of science, how people take, you know, science is one of those things, even the same thing with Maveen, you know, she did this, but now somebody's going to pick her work up and take it to the next level. I see we had a question, you know, who's continuing her work to preserve American Beach? It's the, it's kind of the same thing with science, you know, the next person will come up and build, build on that science. But, um, Back to who's preserving American Beach. It's actually now um, on the national, um, I think it's on the African American Historic Heritage Trail. And it's a preserved place on the National Register of Historic Places. So the, the land is protected forever. And then I think there are caretakers at American Beach who, you know, walk the beach and take care of it. There's also a very small um, at, um, American Beach Museum that's open on the weekends that um, has um, information, more information about the beach and they do different fundraisers and things to preserve the beach and care for it. There is a plaque, you know, when you drive up, there is a National Register plaque there that explains a little bit about the history and it is being, you know, one of the big concerns was it was being squeezed, you know, by the hotel, um, that we're developing for people to stay because you know there's only so much beachfront property. So the timing was perfect that she gave us that wonderful gift that now will be protected forever. So we're going to let you go. You have a busy day, and we're going to look forward to seeing you in real life. We won't have any technological glitches because reality is just always so wonderful that way. <laughs> Three o'clock at the bookmark. Come sign some books and chat with folks. That would be fantastic. I can't thank you enough, Heidi. 
um, not just for joining us, but for the book. I think it's just an exquisite book with an important story that, you know, the thing about um, any kind of good book, it, it, nonfiction should be as entertaining as fiction, if not more, because there's that sense of wow and wonderment and we learn something in spite of ourselves while we're enjoying it. So thank you for all of those wonderful gifts and we will see you later. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Sounds good. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs>